think we should uh, uh, we should start just closing the book. Hello everybody. My name is uh, Nikos Petrulis, and I'll be the basically the timekeeper this afternoon for uh, uh, for uh, for this uh, defense. So welcome everybody. Of course, Johan, the, the assessment uh, committee, the examiners, welcome everybody to the PhD defense of uh, Johan Skiasny. Uh, his uh, uh, lecture uh, today, I think, will be it's entitled "Physics Involved Neural Networks." In bulk for power system dynamics, and this is coinciding with the title of his PhD thesis, if I'm not wrong, which is, uh, of course, in the area of power system dynamics, as the title indicates. I'm following the script here, okay? That's why I'm doing all that. So, uh, as I said, the, the PhD student today uh, defending his thesis is uh, Johan uh, uh, Stiasny. Uh, then he is uh, uh, part of the DTU Wind and Energy uh, Systems. And he was uh, uh, he was supervised in, uh, in his uh, in his work by associated professor Spiros Vasiliadis from DTU Wind and Energy Systems, and was supervised by uh, Professor Pierre Misson from uh, now Imperial College, who, as far as I know, is uh, is online right here, uh, following the following the defense. So today we also have uh, the assessment committee for the thesis, which is. Chaired by uh, Tufe Gutschman from DG Wind and Energy Systems, senior scientist. We also have Professor Michael Cherkov from uh, University of Arizona from the uh, US, and Professor Damien Ernst from University of Liege. So, um, what we're going to do today is in a moment, I will uh, I'll give the floor to, uh, to Jochen to present, uh, to give his lecture. It should be up to 45 minutes. Uh, after which we will take a couple of minutes for, for a small break with Humor Steel, and then we move to the uh, to the question and answers part. Of course, the big part of the of the question and answer will come from the question. But uh, we can also, since we have a time limit for the whole uh, defense, if anyone from uh, the auditorium wants to ask a question, please. Let me know, state your intention, and then we will save some time in the end for that. Okay. Uh, having said that, uh, we, as I said, the, the lecture is going to be 45 minutes, and the whole proceedings should not it should not be more than three hours. So I will, if I have stopped before that at five o'clock, I will uh, I will have to stop the, the proceedings. Uh, and with that, I think I've said everything I, I needed to say for now. So, uh, uh, Jochen, the floor is yours, please. Thank you very much. Yes, and also a very warm welcome to all of you. Pleasure to have you here and also online. So today I'll be talking about physics and functional networks for power system dynamics. And the, the background is that we need to operate a power system as power system engineers. And what our objective with that is that we want to provide stable and secure energy at all times, that we also want to have that low cost so that's affordable for people. And with the climate crisis, uh, in, in the face of the climate crisis, we also need to have that with a low carbon footprint. To, and to achieve those goals, a key tool for power systems engineers are power, uh, time domain simulations. They help us in all kinds of decision making for the operation day to day, but also for uh, planning in the long term and also post fault analysis. And what we do with these time domain simulations is to uh, analyze dynamic phenomena that occur in the power system, so phenomena over time. The foundation for all of this is really differential equations. And differential equations are a very, very general modeling language that can describe fluid uh, flows, but also pandemics as we have to experience over these years, and power system dynamics, and so the dynamics of the power system. And when we when the system change independence of time, we call them usually uh, dynamical system. Now, uh, this, this differential equation modeling framework, so to speak, is a very established one. Like you can go back to Newton uh, for the motion of planets, for example, or, uh, or the motion of objects. It generalizes very well across different, uh, different regimes and also new setups you can easily incorporate. And it scales in the sense that you can uh, 
model different components with differential equations and then uh, use them all together. But exactly with that uh, scaling comes a challenge because we have enormous, uh, the larger the systems get, the more computationally expensive also these uh, time domain simulations become, or these solving these differential equations. Becomes. And in light of the energy transition, this problem is even aggravated because we have more you know, generators, so more wind farms, solar uh, farms, and distributed um, generators. They have faster dynamics usually, so uh, it becomes hard, even harder to simulate. Um, and also, just the phenomena that we need to cover become uh, it'll rely even more on the analysis that time domain simulations provide. Now, if you follow the past 10 years or 20 years, machine learning really has a, become a very powerful other really different uh, model and paradigm. You have uh, very expressive functions that can do a whole range of things. They are usually fairly fast to evaluate compared to, especially to the numerical uh, methods that we use for differential equations. And with the data availability and the computing, uh, machine learning really took off. Now, there are also challenges with machine learning, and one is really generalization. So how well do, uh, when I learn a setup, or if I learned a model, how well does it, can I apply it to another changed setup? And uh, if I encounter an unseen situation, does my model still predict well for that unseen um, situation? So that's generalization, and that's really the key challenge in machine learning. Furthermore, it also takes a long time usually to train these models. If you heard about ChatGPT, and uh, understanding what they actually do is also not that trivial, and there it's it's really different compared to differential equations. So what happened now with physics and formal neural networks is that uh, the key idea is to link these two modeling paradigms. So we now use a machine learning algorithm to learn the solution to a differential equation, trying to to merge this, and that goes back to uh, Raisi and his colleagues, and. The idea is really, or the vision of this is, if we could get the speed and the flexibility of the machine learning models combined with this generalization power and this capability of really model all kinds of phenomena of differential equations, that would be great, right? So my former colleagues, uh, Joris Messieris and Andreas Svenske and Spiros, they tried and gave this initial try to power systems. And, uh, yeah, they got for a single machine, so for one component in the system, could learn such a uh, the differential equation that governs this dynamics. And now, obviously, the question is, can we actually scale this up then to the size that we need for power system dynamics, which are huge. Like a power system can easily have 100 or 1,000 components, and therefore a lot of differential equations associated with this. So that's the uh, central question that we want to try to answer today and also how can we do that, not only. So to do so, I will go first through a bit of um, uh, introductory um, uh, slides on these three topics to then go really in a, let's say a simple initial scaling approach where we take the method as it is and try to scale it up. And we will see kind of what happens with that. To then, because then we will notice that we need to take a step back and uh, see, we need to actually understand much closer what learning a dynamical system actually means. And here the focus is also on dynamical system and not just any differential equation. And what the, with these outcomes and these learnings, we will then uh, be able to propose a simulator called PINSIM that kind of merges these different perspectives and allows us to hopefully uh, achieve a uh, scalable simulator. And I will conclude then with uh, some notes on the trustworthiness of uh, machine learning in general, and uh, then conclude. All right. So let's, let's get started with uh, the introduction. So what we're really talking about today is modeling dynamical systems. And these dynamical systems are usually defined in a form as such that you have on the left side, uh, temporal derivative of a state, state x, and then a function that tells us how this uh, state changes. To make it a little more concrete, we use here a single machine um, or like a generator example, a very simple and classical model with it that has the time you can, uh, that is only dependent on the time in the, on the left side and the derivative. 
you have the states, the rotor angle delta and the frequency deviation omega. And then they depend on the right hand side, as we say. So uh, you have two update functions for each of these state variables. You will have some control inputs, so the, um, the mechanical power, for example, from the uh, from the generator that um, that we can usually control, and some other parameters uh, that govern the, the behavior of the system. Now, to generally classify the system, this is a nonlinear system. That's very important because linear systems are way way simpler to simulate. The problem becomes really when it gets nonlinear, and we have two states. So that's a two, what we call two-dimensional system. Then. And actually, this problem formulation is equivalent from its behavior to a just a pendulum, uh, a nonlinear pendulum. That you and so that tells you it's actually much more general what we're talking about when it's dynamical systems and not just power systems. Okay, when we want so as this update function really describes only the the change at any given moment. If we want to know how things evolve over time, we have to simulate the trajectory uh, to get the temporal uh, evaluation. And that actually means uh, perform performing an integration, so evaluating this integral. And I prepared a like, little animation. So at any point along this trajectory, the differential equation needs to hold. That is the defining property. But to evaluate such an uh, integration, we we cannot solve that just, just like that. We need to use, uh, use um, approximations, numerical integration schemes, and they you often rely on a polynomial approximation, so um, as a function of time, so um, express it as a function of time. And the coefficient, coefficients of this polynomial, they depend on the function f and the initial state from where we start. And um, since this is, if you wanted to predict over, let's say, 10 seconds, it would be take a lot of um, coefficients in this polynomial to to achieve uh, to the accuracy. You usually make your time step small, so you only predict for a small time step, but then repeat that procedure a number of times until you reach uh, the end. So, how does it now compare to when we talk about machine learning and learning um, a solution? And uh, I first show you a little clip how a neural network would learn a diff the solution to this differential equation. And it is, in the end, really a standard neural network and learning procedure where you, you have a data set, um, the, the black dots. You then have a, a loss, so an uh, optimization objective, where you compare the, the prediction with what uh, the ground truth at the data points. And then you iteratively adjust the parameters to minimize this loss. So uh, this evolution that you saw are these iterative steps, also called FOPs in um, Machine learning. Now, if we, uh, yeah, so the neural network that is underlying here is very simple. It takes t, time t as an input, then does some linear transformation, applies a nonlinearity, uh, then again a linear transformation until we reach the output state x. So the states of the dynamical system are what we want to predict. Now, for pins, uh, uh, you notice that in the plot, I don't have any data points like the black dots anymore only at the initial condition at time zero, slight, uh, slightly visible. And instead, I have uh, put these, these uh, vertical lines to indicate that we now uh, change the way we uh, train this uh, network. So it actually looks maybe not too different, but the underlying training procedure is, is very, very different. And uh, we select collocation points, that is times, in our domain at which we evaluate if the prediction of the neural network matches with what the differential equation should be. And this gives us a, a new loss function, a new objective that we want to optimize. And if, if you look out through these terms, it's the difference between um, the slope of the neural network with respect to time and the what the update function should be, uh, be when you uh, give the prediction of uh, your neural network. So that, that is now an, a loss function that entirely depends only on our prediction. We don't need any external simulated data points. And then we can simply uh, uh, minimize a combined loss between the two. So what are the, the conceptual opportunities really with this? They are, as 
neural networks would be, they are very fast to evaluate and they can actually be accurate over long time steps. So the, the videos I showed before, it's we can easily predict um, one or two seconds uh, with a neural network. That's with a classical uh, numerical integration scheme that is actually not that trivial to get necessarily long, these long time steps. But then what the pins really add to the, the standard neural network procedure is that we don't have, uh, that we don't need necessarily data points or if with a few we can help the training, but we don't necessarily need them. And we get this close connection to the update function, and so to the differential equation. So to merge these two paradigms, that's, that's really the idea. All right. Now, what if we take this, uh, this approach and try to scale it to a power system size. And here I use a very simple uh, nine bus system with three generators. And it is, each of the generator is a, is, uh, is a dynamical system as we had just uh, in the slides before. And now they interact with each other by how they in, um, exchange power in between them. And the power transfer is governed by uh, the network, how the network is, and the parameters of the network. Now, we get traject like multiple. Uh, so if we now simulate this dynamical system, we get as before a trajectory, but now not only two variables or not two states, but now we get 24 uh, trajectories in for this particular case. And here I plot how it should look if we use the very accurate scheme. And we can replicate such a um, behavior or like these trajectories with a neural network that's or with a pin. That's it is doable, and uh, yes, but we notice that this pure, like the methodologically pure idea of just using the collocation points, that becomes increasingly hard because those trajectories now become way more intricate and therefore also way more intricate to learn. And at the same time, also the training time really increases uh, significantly. So. If we now want to compare methods against each other, we should look at different characteristics, really. And for uh, integration schemes, speed and accuracy are two of the uh, prime object or prime characteristics that we want to look at. So we start with speed. And I plot here on the right, uh, on the x-axis, the, the prediction time, so far, how far I will uh, want to predict my trajectory. And then the left, uh, on the, on the y-axis, I plot the runtime. So how long does it take to simulate this? And they are logarithmic, I want to note. So with a classical numerical integration scheme, it's a trapezoidal rule, uh, that's with a fixed step size. So I just do the same step size uh, and then repeat until I reach the limit. I get a yeah, linear increase with the number of step sizes. So not, for, not very surprising, but the longer I want to predict, the more time I need to spend. In contrast, if I use a bit more advanced solvers, I get to choose the step size length depending on how accurate the simulation is. And for the long um, prediction times, I can actually decrease the simulation time then by some margin. However, when we look at what pins or neural networks could do, is that they can cut these costs to a constant. So it doesn't matter how long I predict, with the exception, of course, for what I trained. So for the time that I trained, it doesn't matter if I uh, predict at 0.1 second or at 10 seconds, if I try for that range. And the difference, or like the factor between uh, the classical numerical integration scheme and pins can easily be a uh, hundred times. And if we did a similar analysis kind of for the accuracy, so how can we control accuracy and how does it, uh, is it affected? We can see that with numerical integration schemes, we can uh, control this accuracy very well on the go, um, because we use numerical tolerances there. But to improve the speed significantly is, is uh, way more difficult. On the other hand, with pins, they are fast by design. This speed, uh, like this, where this constant line will be, is just mostly a matter of the size and uh, how well we implement it on the network. But on the other hand, the, the accuracy is very uh, difficult to control, and it's actually controlled by how well we trained. The, the neural network in advance. So for the grid operator, now the question is really, which methods uh, should I choose or which uh, method, methods should I go for? And here, 
one criterion, for example, could be the uh, total computational cost. So overall, how much computation uh, cost or time do I need to spend to uh, perform all these uh, actions? And so this depends on the number of evaluations. So how often do I will I use this uh, simulation or this solver tool? And then I get on the y-axis the total computation cost. For numerical integration scheme, that will just look like a, a, a linear curve. So it doesn't matter if I do this computations 10 or 100 times or a million times, uh, it will uh, scale by roughly that factor. In contrast, mm -hmm. pins, neural networks, they, we first need to train them. So before we can do the first evaluation, we actually need to spend a lot of time on the training. And so we get kind of a fixed cost first before we can even go to, uh, to apply the neural network. And so then, but then when we when we have a trained, the evaluations are very cheap. They're way faster than the uh, numerical integration schemes. And so then we can uh, recapture kind of these initial fixed costs. It's, it's a very classic economic uh, analysis that you can do here. And from that, you would also say, okay, there should be a critical number of evaluations that we need uh, uh, from which point on it would make sense from a total computational cost perspective to use pins. And in the example that we had in the, uh, the thesis, that is around maybe 100 to 1,000 evaluations of the setup that we used. But this is very dependent on exactly the system and your implementation and how efficient it is. Now, there's one caveat that I didn't mention because what happens when we change parameters, when we change the network topology, when we change uh, the set point of a generator, or even if we want to start from a different initial condition. Because uh, I didn't say that, um, or I didn't say that before, it's like we chose a very, very specific setup here to learn these trajectories and where the pin could do actually quite well. So what happens then, we could either retrain the neural network every time, but then uh, it's very difficult to reach the, the critical number of evaluations that you need. Or, and it would also overall of course, increase our training time like uh, a lot. So, is this really favorable? Questions questionable. And then we could also try to incorporate all these variations. But if you really want to do large power systems, the the variations that you need to um, yeah consider they just grow dramatically and very very rapidly. And learning high dimensional problems is actually uh, very difficult for what for our purpose, learning a very high dimensional space will be very, very difficult. So um, that also will increase our training cost. And uh, so we're kind of yeah. in a dilemma, what, what do we do now? So yeah, that is actually uh, to take away like these power system dynamics problems, they are high dimensional problems and they're not easy to learn. So therefore uh, we need to be a bit smarter about it. And because pins are really, um, designed for highly repetitive tasks. You learn it once and then you can uh, just apply it and apply it and apply it again and again. And in a way, that's what numerical solvers do. They, they are applied a lot of times, repeatedly the same functions or the same construction methods. So this brings us to uh, looking a bit closer at the relation between pins and the dynamic and dynamical systems. And, Really, why I want to understand it is because dynamical systems are a sub important subclass of differential equations in general, and pins so far have been mostly applied to general um, differential equations. And also, by getting a much better understanding of the problem that we want to solve, we can also devise better methods and incorporate knowledge uh, into the training procedure, and thereby reduce the training cost and improve the accuracy. That's the hope, at least. So therefore, I'm going to go through a little bit of visualization to give an intuition what what really the problem is that we want to solve. And so I plot here the, the trajectory, so the evaluate, evolution over time of the two states of our system. But now I can do that actually also in 3D. And it becomes clear that this is kind of a spiraling motion. And it is a, the, the trajectory is, for this case, more like a 3D phenomenon than really a, a 2D phenomenon. So when we want to predict from the gray plane at time zero to uh, the red time uh, at, or like to the value at time one, so that the red plane, that's what we do with the integration usually. And uh, that's what we want to replicate with our pin. Now there is of course not only 
one possible input state for like in the in the gray plane. I could also use other start at other points and other states, so to speak. And they would land at different uh, points on this uh, red plane. And what I want to be able to is actually have a, a way to really predict between the red, uh, the black, and the red plane at, uh, for uh, for a certain time time step size. But then, if we go more, that's what called what's called the flow map. If we go more, let's say ambitious, actually, we want to be able to also vary the the time step size. So I want to be able to know where the state will be at. Point one seconds, but also at uh, one second. So that is described in uh, numerics with with the flow or dynamic systems with the flow of of the system, and it is really the volume that we now want to uh, try to predict here. And numerical uh, integration schemes, although it's not always like really framed in this, they essentially approximate or give approximation of this flow. So. Question is, can we replicate something like this with pins so that we then um, learn easier and learn a more uh, more widely applicable solution so that we can get our high number of repetitive um, evolutions and therefore get an over, overall computationally beneficial method. And because if we do that, then also we can do time stepping this because the flow, if it, uh, your system doesn't change with uh, like the function, update function doesn't vary with time, you can apply the same flow function again and again and again and get this time stepping scheme and uh, therefore get uh, a very similar behavior like numerical integration schemes. Now, you can actually learn this in a completely, like without knowing anything about the physics. You simply use a machine standard machine learning uh, procedure where you have a large enough you know, network so that you uh, really can represent everything that you need to represent, and you have enough data points. So you have to cover your volume with enough data points so that um, you capture uh, these uh, these firing emotions. And to be to be honest, this is, can be a actually a great baseline for whatever we want to try afterwards. Because there are challenges. How will this look in higher dimensional spaces? It's again the same problem that if we increase the dimensionality of this problem, learning, like sampling a dense, uh, sampling the space densely, so place enough points in the space will be become increasingly difficult. And what we really want to know is that uh, for any, or we trained on some points and we also want to uh, have for unseen points, also good prediction, like this generalization capacity. And uh, how this error behaves when we just uh, increase the dimensional reality, that is uh, at least questionable if we go to a much higher dimensions. So this brings us then to the, the whole idea of physics-informed learning, I would say, um, that we want to exploit all the prior knowledge that we have. We know exactly how this uh, flow or We have good ideas for, or good understanding from numerical integration, how this flow approximation should look like, what are favorable characteristics, et cetera. And, but in the end, it's mostly about gaining training efficiency. So uh, um, being able to train faster, spending less computation time on it, and also control the this generalization error. So know how uh, it will behave on unseen points, how the, the prediction will behave on unseen points. And there are, Many uh, possibilities, really, to uh, to do this. One is the, the plain pins that we uh, that we had earlier, that, where we include use the update function f in the loss, and that is one such possibility. Now there are also other ones, and one I'm gonna give you three examples uh, of this. So one is that the state space, which is actually the space, if you look at the, the gray plane from the left along the time axis, that's what we call the state space. And we can kind of get the motion of the of the system, how this behaves like the spiral, uh, we can see in this uh, streamline box. But if you look at the scales here on the uh, X and the Y axis, they are very different. And for learning setup, this is not uh, really favorable because the error of point one in one direction means a very different thing uh, in the other direction. So this is, uh, we want all our errors to have a kind of a similar mean or uh, yeah, meaning to that, or an impact, let's say. So 
this the state space is actually entirely dependent on the function f. So if I know f, we could construct this. This only works well in two or three, maybe three dimensions. Otherwise, it gets uh, too hard to visualize. But we can find characteristic points. And so what we proposed in the thesis is to uh, scale based on these points, scale uh, this dynamical system so that we have normalized coordinates. So now an error in the, the y direction has a similar impact uh, as in the x direction. And that is entirely based on the update function f. Now, another very useful property of numerical integration schemes, basically actually how they are constructed um, from the um, get-go, is that when you don't do any time steps, so when you uh, give a time step of zero, you should uh, land at exactly the same spot as before. But with a neural network, that's actually not that trivial, uh, or it's not given, at least by, um, by construction. So um, to, we can achieve that, though, by simply applying the what we get from the, the neural network, uh, the output, we multiply that with the time step size. And so then when we plug in zero for that, we uh, ensure that we land at the same spot as the initial uh, condition. And so now the red curve without any training, so the, the plots there are, um, so the dashed line is the exact curve. Um, the gray lines were just a regular neural network. Uh, and the red line is now with this adjusted architecture. Without any training, we already get this numerical consistency. And we can do even better by also fitting the first derivative to it. Uh, and uh, so now the blue curve not only fits the point, but also the derivative at the initial condition. And that is really just taking the ideas from, um, from, the, uh, from numerical schemes, how they're constructed. And that that is actually was proposed 25 years in a, in a already. Like it's it's not or it, it's a very intuitive idea too. Now a lot the last point that I want to mention is that um, machine learning always is or there is a lot of hyperparameters uh, in these in the learning problems. So um, coefficients like in the loss function where we can find Lx, which is on based on data. Uh, with the collocation loss. This factor alpha says how I should weigh these two against each other. And you need to know how to weigh them. And usually that uh, we do that by either because we kind of know where it should, in which range it should be, but otherwise just by exploring it. So if we can provide meaning to this, that can be help very helpful to overall uh, improve the efficiency and reliability of our approaches. And so what we did there was to view machine learning more from the probabilistic um, from probabilistic angle where it really comes from. And so then we can derive an expression here for alpha C that has that we can interpret at, as that it has a, a terms that um, describe the tolerance towards errors between the for the data for the error based on data sets on the data set and based on the, the physics. And Kind of how this ratio is. Uh, it should both should be zero in the end if we learned an exact solution. But until we are there, uh, it's good to have an idea about this ratio. And on the other hand, uh, on the other hand, the number of data points and collocation points also plays factors into this uh, how this alpha c should be chosen. So by really trying to uh, link it to the physics and quantities that we can interpret we hopefully get better understanding and therefore more efficient training procedures uh, for hyperparameters. And we explore, uh, explore a few more options in the thesis. That it is not exactly about a particular method, but just overall what improves our efficiency and uh, how do we get uh, our neural network to behave in a way that is useful in the, uh, the application that we uh, want, to, want to use it for. Okay, so I think the, really the key takeaways is this idea of pins being a an approximation of the flow is very helpful to understand how we can generalize and make them more widely applicable. And then also, yeah, just use all the knowledge that you have from the related domain of numerical integration to achieve uh, greater accuracy and efficiency. So now we come to PINSIM, where we really want to try to merge these topics and again attempt the uh, attempt the uh, scalability question. 
So, so we are really back to that picture that we had earlier, where we simply attempted to scale our uh, pin approach. And what we're now gonna, or I'm gonna go now a little more in detail of uh, what is actually happening um, or what's governed by the equations and then how we can use pins there. So each component in this network injects a current and uh, that then becomes power if you multiply it with the voltage. And this current, or and it's a dynamical component, so it has states and these states are governed by the, uh, the function f, so uh, the local dynamics. And on the other hand, this uh, these dynamics and hence the current injection will now also depend on the on the voltage at uh, the bus where it is connected. And like that, we have now three uh, generators in this case. And additionally, you can also have other loads, for example, so they draw uh, current. They can be either also dynamic, uh, dynamic components or suppose just depend on the voltage. On the other hand, we have the, the power network that distributes the power. And uh, so we have current flows from uh, along the uh, along the lines, and they depend on the the system structure and on the voltage at all the buses. And what how these equations are set up is that uh, Kirchhoff's law need to be obeyed at all times. So that is that the current balance needs to be um, fulfilled at any given bus. So any current coming in needs to go also current uh, going out of that bus, and what I didn't, for a bit of notation clarity, I didn't include here that all these variables are dependent on time. So they evolve with time, and that was the trajectories uh, that we saw earlier with of this um, of the system. Now, to solve such a system, we get a bit of a uh, chicken and egg problem because the states depend on the voltage, and the voltage through the currents also depends then again on the state. So uh, you get Kind of a loop and you need to somehow to break it and that's what numerical schemes do but uh they you often focus like start with uh breaking up or start with the state an assumption on how the state evolves we in contrast here with pinsim start with how the um, an assumption on how the voltage evolves over time so your voltage can for example change linearly with with time and so that i can describe with two parameters the value at uh, time zero and then how the slope is and like that i can describe the voltage evolution and i do that like that for each bus what i can do now is with that known voltage ev evolution i can actually evolve uh, evaluate the state dynamics so i can solve the differential equation of the components and yeah for that pins actually are perfect because there we can uh, learn quite difficult um, quite difficult dynamics uh, in a very like then easy to evaluate way. So we can predict the state then with pins. And we do that not only for one component, but for all three, but they're completely separate from each other. Like they don't need to know anything uh, about each other at that stage. Um, and so what we then get is a current, so the uh, an approximated current ejection or so that's not exact, but it's, uh, it's approx an approximation uh, based on the, on the uh, components and how approximately the um, the currents in the network flow based on how this uh, how we uh, chose the voltage profiles. And our task now becomes to match the current balance. So the current balance, if, it, if it, we got the right solution, this current balance would hold at all times, but uh, we will get some error there, but we try to uh, really minimize this error. And so how, how we go with uh, Pinsim, how we go about that is that we start with an initial guess for the voltage. So we could, for example, start just with a constant voltage and then uh, start an iterative procedure. We evaluate all the current injections. We evaluate all the network flows or the, all the network currents always based on the on the assumed voltage profiles. And we can actually also evaluate if we change these assumed voltage, uh, if that change, if we change those parameters slightly, how would that affect the, the currents uh, that are injected? So we, we can compute this actually um, uh, in a very straightforward way. 
And so then we compare those two and try then to reduce the error by adjusting the parameters of the voltage profile. So I change my, uh, by changing then my assumed voltage, I can kind of try to find to, uh, the parameters that minimize uh, the difference. And this is a kind of a very standard nonlinear uh, least square problem and if I formula gets that. And uh, so this is something we know how to do basically. So how this looks now is uh, I will now show a trajectory and I start with a with pinsim in red and the exact solution uh, with the black dashed line for a time step size of point um point oh five seconds. So we now go back to small time steps uh, like um doing small time steps. And so if I then do these time steps, I will get eventually a curve. And as you can uh, tell, at least visually, this the uh, it approximates this, uh, or it gets this trajectory nearly uh, exactly right. Now we can actually increase the time step size to like triple it to point uh, one five seconds. And so now we progress with each each step we could progress much uh, faster and so we can again simulate this whole trajectory and it still looks uh, looks nearly right but there are some uh, inaccuracies so if we make our time step size larger we will uh, get more inaccuracy now if we compare that to what a another numerical integration scheme the trapezoidal rule can do you can see that for the same time step size there are between point one 1.5 and 2 seconds, there are really significant errors. And the fact that we at 3 seconds are nearly the, get nearly the same status uh, here, uh, more of a coincidence rather than uh, a true thing. So therefore, we would need to reduce the time step size and so take smaller time steps with the numerical method, the classical numerical method. Now, to it all depends in the end on the, the voltage profile and how the, uh, the current balance, how well we can match that and so for the for the small time step size 0.05 you can see we have like we really track the, the voltage evolution well and if you look closely between 1.5 and 2 seconds you can notice if i flip between two slides that there is for the larger time steps i get slight inaccuracies and that is because for this case we assumed only a linear voltage profile and so it is clear that we cannot fit a curved uh, a curved voltage evolution but if we use higher order, like a more um, elaborate voltage um, parameterization, we can also we can also deal with that. So we can use a, a squared or a cubic function there. And very, I think, insightful is to then look at the current balance or like the error between um, the uh, the currents in a bus. And you see for this large time step size that it go is all around zero, but uh, these these errors are large compared to when we reduce the time step size, then we get much, much smaller uh, current errors. And therefore we get also the high, more accurate results of the simulation. Okay, so it is really uh, by being able to do longer time step size, which comes down to the pins mostly, uh, we have a potential acceleration because if each time step is faster uh, or it doesn't take too much additional effort, then fewer time steps will accelerate of overall uh, the simulation. The scaling, very important, is not learning dependent. All what the learning I do is just per component, so they don't need to know about uh, anything itself. So if we do thousand buses, we need to learn a lot of pins, but they are not. Uh, we don't get a thousand more, um, a very large state space, and so it's it's really about creating these low dimensional uh, learning sub problems that allows us to benefit from uh, from pins. And that brings me now uh, to the last part. And here I want to uh, discuss briefly for um, yeah, the issue of trust in machine learning methods, which in power systems is very, very critical because power systems are safety critical systems at, or some, some operations at least of it. So if we make a mistake there, in the worst, worst case, this kind of Lead to a blackout, but uh, even like therefore, it's it's very important to to be sure about what predictions are we making and how uh, reliable and trustworthy. They are. And so, I in the thesis I said um, to kind of make it more tangible and more decide do we trust something or not. 
that actually when the benefits outweigh the risks, then that is an approach that we trust. And uh, if it's not, then we don't trust it. And so if you try to then uh, yeah, split it up a little bit, this big question of trust, we can ask for uh, different types of trust. And I think there is a trust in a problem formulation. So the how we set up our problem in the first place. Is it useful to, uh, to get informed about a certain phenomenon? So is it use, are these useful representations? That's one form of trust. But then there is another trust that is the solution algorithm. And with these numerical integration schemes, they have kind of gained our uh, trust that they produce very accurate results or useful solutions, and we know how to control uh, the accuracy of those. But it is, depending on where, uh, which, on which level of trust you are, you get different task uh, requirements and objectives, and that um, affects the learning, uh, the learning problem, and therefore also the uh, the suitable um, machine learning methods. In this in this presentation, I really mostly fo uh, or I focused on the solution algorithm that we try to replicate with pins. Uh, on that note, actually, pins can also be used for the problem formulation part, so uh, to identify uh, functions, but it has a very different, you suddenly get very different objectives of what the pain should do. And so keeping those in mind uh, is really the first step to uh, to build trust. In this practice. And then we need to, like, with the, uh, if we then go to the modeling process, actually, of learning the method, it's, it's much more a question of, can we build this trustworthy enough so that we don't um, lose the trust that we built in the, uh, in the solution setting? So um, here, by good practice, uh, by having good practices and understanding what we are learning, we can then really uh, tailor the, the uh, methods so that they uh, fulfill the purpose that, that we uh, intend them to. OK, with that, I come to my conclusion on pins for power system dynamics. And the first, uh, and I think the big conclusion is that this is a, it is a very powerful um, modeling framework for dynamical systems. This combination of machine learning and dynamical systems is something where there's a lot to explore. But the scalability is really, really challenging due to high dimensional problems. And uh, we need to always keep that in mind when we apply pens. There are no wonder work there uh, to overcome this. We need to work hard uh, if we want to get a scalability. The, I think also this close link to the numerical methods Bringing this interpretation and uh, these insights and methods from other fields to our uh, application is very, very important because then we can uh, get uh, improve the, uh, the efficiency and uh, uh, the generalization error of our of our learned models of our pins. And yeah, then lastly, uh, with the topic of pin sim, that really is an approach. Where we hopefully can, like it's, there was a proof of concept that we presented here, but that all the components they are scalable by design. So uh, this should be um, should be a great way forward. And uh, this combination of pins with conventional algorithms is is really the key to it. And so for like what what are the next steps? I think it is a very good vision to imagine pins in as a general purpose simulator for power system dynamics. So it needs to do all kinds of different things. Like that was a very, very specific setup that I chose here to demonstrate it. But what you want from a, a general simulator or solver is that it's accurate, efficient, and reliable for a wide range of uh, applications and setups and so on. And that has two sides. One is more on the component level, so for, for the pins, and uh, where we investigated very simple dynamics, you can make this a lot more complicated. So that complicates your learning problem, but uh, that's a very fruitful way uh, forward. Then ideally you would like to just give the update function F and then have an automized procedure uh, that learns uh, the, these pins by themselves. And how do we assess these pins? Uh, what, like, we need to kind of develop a, a certification or um, a methodology to assess error. Uh, in a, in a standardized and founded way. And then on the system level, so 
putting this all together for the uh, pacing, it's much more about how systems have many different uh, setups like short circuit um, or topology changes that uh, need to be uh, studied. Then the error analysis and the control of it is very important. And uh, also how the convergence properties are. And yeah, with that vision, I would like to close and thank you all for attending. I'm happy to take questions. Thank <laughs> you.